Hello everyone, Larry Du Bois here, and today we're going to begin our third in a series of a dozen or so topics concerning the birth of Jesus Christ, or I call it the Christmas series. This is number three, entitled The Messiah's Genealogy, and we're recording on a, a foggy fall day here in Midtown Sacramento, California at my home studio today is uh, is Tuesday uh, the 7th of December in the year of our Lord 2021 and last week uh, we did or I should say last time I'm, I'm rapidly going through these to get them all done by Christmas we had talked about the uh, Old Testament prophecies so if you haven't checked out that one please do now Let's go ahead and uh, give a little bit of an overview. First of all, I'd like to say that over the years, the genealogies concerning the birth of Christ I have studied uh, at length to a degree where I feel comfortable teaching on it. I don't pretend to have it down pat by any means. In fact, I'm going to expect you uh, to be good Bible students and as I am, and research it yourself. There's lots of stuff out there. There's some, you know, John MacArthur's one source that you could look at uh, over the years he's preached on this. There's others as well, and they bring out a lot of different things that probably I'm not going to be able to get to, but I want to give you the, just the, the highlights. Uh, most people feel that, you know, reading through the genealogies, especially in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis or Chronicles, it can be very tedious. And you ask yourself, why is this in, even in here? What does this have to do with me? Well, um, there's a reason why there's things in the Bible, even though we don't maybe appreciate them or understand them all. But when it comes to the genealogy of Jesus Christ, of course, it's very important because this was one of the many credentials that you had to have in the Jewish community before they would accept you uh, to be the Messiah you had to have certain credentials and one of those credentials is that you had to be related to King David and going back in the Old Testament there was a lot of scriptures and again I'm gonna let you research that because I am I'm talking I think to the most part mature Christians They're, they already have established and it's a well-known fact that the Messiah was going to be a descendant of King David and so that was one of the things that would be under scrutiny if you were a, a potential candidate to say you were the Messiah or people thought you might be whatever it was you had to have those certain credentials and one of them was being related to King David now Jesus of course uh, was related and he was related by both parents but it's a little tricky because Mary of course his natural mother born of a virgin through her he was not related biologically to Joseph. Joseph was the husband of Mary. Joseph was the uh, father of Jesus' adopted father. And there'd been some that actually had given a comparison of that aspect. And we as believers are adopted into God's family. And they did a correlation. It was a beautiful piece. I wish I would have remembered where I found it because it was just wonderful how they went through it and how we are adopted and Jesus in his earthly ministry or his earthly existence born a man God became a man he had an earthly father but not a biological father in Joseph he was born of the Holy Spirit so we're gonna look at both of these but I would say in, a, in an overview and of course you can see my notes here um, now this messianic genealogy chart I don't expect you to read it um, it just has a list I basically put up there for a visual effect um, to enhance the fact that we're going through this as a number three video series here but an overview Matthew starts off in his gospel beginning in the first verse first 17 verses and he covers Joseph's line through Solomon to David focusing on the proof that Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah 
He is the rightful heir of the kingly throne. This man, uh, this is the main point in Matthew's account, as he does not include a complete version, but skips some of the generations. Matthew starts with Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, since Joseph was not the natural father of Jesus, but Jesus being adopted and having the legal right to the throne. Now, let's point out a few th interesting things in Matthew in his gospel account of the or the genealogy account. Matthew focuses on the Messiah's relationship to two people, Abraham and David. Abraham and David were well accepted by the Jewish nation, by the people, as being basically very important people. Abraham, the father, not only of the Jewish nation, but he's the father of many nations. King David, of course. Uh, the first he wasn't the first king in Israel, but he was the first king in Israel that had God's overall approval. He was called one after God's own heart. And from that time on, he would have someone sit on David's throne. And so David was a very important part in this whole thing as well. Another thing, uh, sort of a side note here in the genealogy, not so much about uh, the birth of Christ, but Four women are included in this genealogy. Now, this is unlike the Old Testament. Um, in the, They didn't include women in a lot of these things. And so for four women that Matthew includes, it's very significant. It puts them in a high place. But they're mentioned. Now, it was basically a little bit of a scandal, some of these gals. And we're going to go through that. The next thing on my bullet point there, Jeconiah is mentioned, and this was a curse on David's line here. Now, when we get to next time uh, in session four, talking about the virgin birth, we'll cover this in detail, that there was a curse. Now, Joseph is mentioned again as the husband of Mary. He's not the biological father of Jesus. Now, Matthew's list could be verified by temple records. And with the temple being destroyed in 70 AD, no one could prove today that they are the Messiah, not being able to be traced back to David, because those records are gone. But <laughs> hallelujah, there's no need, because Messiah has, has come, God's great design. Uh, that's just wonderful. Okay, let's move on a little bit here, and let's take a look at this genealogy. Now, I'm not going to read it all the way through. We're just going to cover the highlights. But again, Matthew, he traces Joseph's line to King David through Solomon. Now, in the day of Jesus on the earth, the Pharisees who hated him, and they were always trying to trap Jesus in his words. They were always trying to figure out a way to, you know, discredit him, whatever it took. They couldn't get anything on him. And ultimately, they crucified him for no good reason. Well, they could have went to the temple and dug up records and could have went to him and said, Hey, look, you know, this is wrong. You can't be the Messiah, you know, because of this. But they couldn't. Everything was legit. And what I mean by that is Joseph being the you know, adopted, uh, you know, the legal guardian, if you will, of Jesus. Jesus had a right to that throne, even though he was not born physically through Joseph. Well, anyway, let's look at some of the highlights there I have on my I highlighted, I emboldened the word Abraham. And this is where Matthew says, Abraham begot Isaac, and then he starts in. And he starts with Abraham. But the first verse, he says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He was called the son of David in a messianic title. A lot of the times he was called the son of David. So that's where Matthew starts. Now, these blue highlighted in italics, 
Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and the wife of Uriah. To a certain degree, these women were scandalous. In other words, Jesus had skeletons in his closet. And to come into the world, into this humanity, he had to have come through people, sinful people. Although he was virgin born and he was not tainted with sin because God had conceived him by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was still born and to this world and through sinful people. So his ancestors were, you know, they were just normal people, but a lot of them were, were problematic. Let's just take Tamar real quick. If you go back and read the story about her, she was the daughter-in-law of Judah initially. And she had married one of his sons. The son had died. So the, the tradition was she was going to marry the next son in line and he died and then she you know judah didn't want her marrying any of the other sons and figured that she was some sort of black widow or something well as it turned out uh, she conceived this plan and she hid herself and she pretended she was a harlot and long story short judah went into her and they had a son perez and he was in succession to the messianic line and so it was a scandalous thing this uh, daughter-in-law with this harlotry and all this crazy stuff you can read about that in the book of Genesis next up is Rahab and in the book of Joshua we meet Rahab who is also the mother basically she's the grandmother let's see what would that be the great-grandmother of Jesus Rahab was a prostitute and she was the one who was in Jericho and when the spies came in there to check it out before they were going to come and destroy it she had understood this and she hid the spies and in return they promised to spare her and her father's house while well, she ended up going along with Israel and became one of them she ends up marrying this guy named uh, uh, Salmon. So they have Boaz. Well, anyway, so that's her. Then that, you, we go to Ruth, and you've remembered the story of Ruth in the book of Ruth. She was a Moabite woman. Now, this was a virtuous woman. Now, she didn't have really any scandalous activity in her life. She was a virtuous woman, but nevertheless, she was a Moabite. And that was a, you know, she had basically had converted to Judaism but being a Moabite, and she is included. Moabites were not considered to be part of the, the Jews' affairs, and they were, you know, but she was accepted in faith. Uh, fourthly, now, we have the wife of Uriah. This is Bathsheba, and this is the one who David had an affair with and then ended up killing her husband, Uriah. Now, interesting, it gives her... Uh, yeah, she was the mother of Solomon, and it gives her um, event there, but doesn't call her by name. It's almost like she doesn't get that respect because Uriah should be the one remembered. He was murdered, and, and he was innocent, and the wife of Uriah, so she doesn't even get her name in there, but that's who that was with Bathsheba, and you can read that story as well if you'd like to. If you, you Most of you probably already read these stories. All right, so down the list here, we got one more. Oh, I, I highlighted David the king begot Solomon because that's the key there. That was through the line of Solomon, the kingly uh, royal throne. Now, in verse 11 there, Josiah begot Jeconiah. Now, Jeconiah is the one who had the curse on him. And we'll, like I said, we'll get into more of that in um, the next section there when we do the virgin birth. So basically... We're just kind of skimming over. I'm not going to read every uh, person's name there, and I'd probably butcher it and wouldn't pronounce them right. There's some names in there that are familiar in other parts of the Bible. Jerubbabel, uh, he is mentioned, I think, in some of the minor prophets there. He was a governor or something like that. Um, some of these overlap. Um, a lot of times there's names of people that are 
there's more than one person called Joseph, there's one more than one person called Jacob, that sort of thing. And so it's interesting if you listen to the Bible on video or audio and listen to the person that reads these genealogies and pronounces the names, they must have really researched it in that. But they do a really good job. Okay, and Luke now, we're going to go to Luke. He doesn't get into his... Uh, explaining of the genealogy till chapter 3. Chapter 1, of course, he's dealing with the, the birth of John the Baptist and all the events that took place there. And in chapter 2, he talks about the birth of Christ. And in 3, he moves on to John the Baptist, his ministry, but he gives this as a proof of the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. He starts with a man named Heli, and that's uh, Mary's father. And so that goes back to David through his son, Nathan. So Jesus not only has the royal line through the adoption of Joseph there back to King David through Solomon, he also has the bloodline, the humanity line, going back to King David through another son, Nathan. And so Luke now, he also does something unique. He goes all the way back to Adam. And then even mentions that Adam is the son of God because God created Adam in the beginning, the first man. Now, this was to prove the bloodline then, and Jesus in his humanity would qualify for Messiah. The word son is not in the original language. So this could mean a son or grandson. So we see this. Um, it's not a, another complete list. So it can get a little confusing because sometimes they'll overlap and you're wondering why it seems like there's a contradiction. And one might be talking about the son and one might be talking about the grandson. If you compare the genealogies of Luke and uh, Matthew and line them up. But we see this sort of thing in the narrative of Daniel. Belteshazzar was actually he's called the son of Nebuchadnezzar, but in actuality he was the grandson. So this is sort of a common thing in old in the old world now if we look at luke's version of the genealogies and it says jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age being as was supposed the son of joseph because they thought he was illegitimate they had no understanding of the virgin birth and his enemies uh, thought he was a what well, they'd call him a bastard child uh, illegitimate child and in the law there was no illegitimate child that could be allowed in the temple it had all kinds of laws like that but Jesus he was uh, not born illegitimately he was born of the power of the Holy Spirit now he uh, so he starts off with Heli and it gets a little confusing because it is Mary's line and it goes uh, to King David through Nathan. And so I highlighted, so there's some names again, Jerubbabel, Shealtiel, uh, some of these names. We got uh, Nathan, the son of David. So going back to David, now he keeps going and goes back. And of course, it's through Abraham. And then he keeps going, though, and goes back. So he starts with Jesus, goes back, all the way back to Adam and says that the son of Adam, the son of God, where Matthew starts with Abraham and goes forward to Jesus. So those are the similar uh, similarities and the differences. Excuse, excuse me. <coughs> so the summary I have for the podcast, it's going to be written in the, in the notes there. Uh, I wanted to show you this other little chart I had made. And let me see here. If I can bring it up. Okay, here it is. I'm bringing it up over here. Um, we're going to shrink it down and get it out of the way here a little bit. Um, okay, so birth of Christ chronologically, uh, or the story, I should say, in Matthew, and I compared Matthew and Luke. So again, when they have the genealogies, 
Matthew, it's Christ through Solomon. Luke, it's Christ through Nathan. Both go to King David. They were both his sons. Matthew focuses on Joseph, and Luke focuses on Mary. The angel appears to Joseph in a dream. The birth announcement by the angel came to Mary. So those are very similar. Jesus born in Bethlehem, and then in Luke, Jesus born in Bethlehem in greater detail. The Magi, or wise men, follow the star from the east. That's included in Matthew's gospel. The angels announce the birth to the uh, shepherds uh, in the field. So those are two events that are covered each by those individual authors. Uh, of course, the Magi present gifts to the child Jesus. Jesus brought to the temple in Jerusalem. So that's they're not uh, both covered in the same gospel. Those are differences there. The flight to Egypt and child massacre in Bethlehem and Joseph and Mary settle in Galilee. So those are almost the, the headings I use for the following uh, future shows, if you will, episodes in the series, the Christmas series here of 2021. So anyway, there's that. I'll reduce that back down. And that about wraps it up. Uh, my friends, like I mentioned, it's uh, there's a lot to listen to. If you want to listen to audio and videos on this subject, you can uh, search it. Sometimes it's it's good to find somebody that's not so popular, like the the usual guys out there, like the the John MacArthur's or R.C. Sproul, or um, you know, you got uh, all kinds of uh, scholarly people on both. Uh, you know, in the conservative camps and maybe more of the charismatic camps. And there's, it's good to listen to all kinds of different ones and you'll gain some under, understanding out of each one. Usually they'll bring up a point the other person didn't think of. So I think the Proverbs, it says that there's a, there's safety in many counselors. And if you take that and put it into an application for, for Bible study, it's good to have several sources so that, uh, we kind of watch over each other, if you will, so we're not going to end up in error. Well, anyway, that covers it, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this, and thank you, and you have a blessed time now. Uh, God bless. Bye-bye.